And now, ABC's 2020. I don't want to talk to you. Why not? I'll tell you that because I don't like you. Get away from me. Is this how you treat the young this boys? This how I treat you. Tonight, the year-long 2020 investigation that led to this unbelievable parking lot meltdown. A man accused of keeping teenagers almost imprisoned. I can't stop seeing their faces, hearing the screams, hearing the crying. The now abandoned camp where their parents put them. These are the isolation booths. To change their sexuality. I'm going to be the gay demon out of you. Camps trying to pray away the gay. The one against the word of God. But tonight, the teen who managed to escape, the retired cop who helped expose a nightmare. They should never have to suffer like this. It's just about showing up. And TV star Jeremy Jordan coming to the rescue of his gay cousin, speaking out tonight against even nonviolent programs. They were taking drastic measures and putting her away for being gay. Good evening, I'm Elizabeth Vargas. And I'm David Muir. Tonight here, our 2020 cameras going undercover to investigate the extremely controversial use of gay conversion therapy, banned for use by licensed therapists with minors in five states, with efforts going on right now in 20 other states to also ban it. And what our Brian Ross discovered were camp counselors using the cloak of God and religion to get away with what many see as outright abuse, emotional and physical. So let us know what you think on Facebook and Twitter as we take you into a hidden world. In three quarters of a mile, turn left onto County Road 87. I know we talked on the phone previously. Yes, ma'am. And you know that my main concern is that my son believes he's a homosexual. Mm -hmm. Take a slight left turn onto Brewer Road. We found what we were looking for down a county road in Alabama, the Blessed Hope Boys Academy. Where's Brother Gary? Brother Gary. Okay, thank you. A place where a Christian pastor will tell our 2020 undercover investigators that with a Bible and sometimes a belt, he knows how to deal with teenagers who consider themselves gay. So nice to meet you. This is going against the Word of God. It is not biblically right. It is just one of a number of places discovered by ABC News in a year-long investigation. Some operating with brutality and others with just therapy. Practicing a notion denounced by leading medical groups that gay teens can choose to change their sexuality. For every camp like this, there are a hundred more that nobody knows about, that nobody's exposing on TV including one place run by men who call themselves Christian pastors with a track record of cruelty. These are not religious people. These are people that are using religion as a weapon against these kids for further abuse. The first leads in our investigation came months earlier from two gay teens who say they had been held against their will in so-called Christian camps or academies. One, a 16-year-old boy who arrived in New York on a late-night bus. Lucas Greenfield telling us he had just escaped from one of the camps in the South. How you feeling? Tired. Really tired. And the other teen, 17-year-old Sarah Jabert from a small town in Texas, who was sent to a Christian boarding school for counseling one week after she defied her parents and went to the high school prom with her girlfriend. Their beliefs told them that people who were gay would go to hell, and so I think that the thought of their own daughter not being with them in heaven was probably upsetting to them. In the case of Lucas Greenfield, he was uprooted from Naples, Florida, which became his home after he was adopted at the age of three. Lucas was raised in what he calls a Christian home, but he says he increasingly came to know he was gay to his mother's great distress. Because she wanted me to change into more of like what she wanted me to be, which was very Christian, uh, very religious, almost like a perfect kid. Lucas trying to find a place where he could be accepted as gay, and Sarah declaring her affection for a girlfriend in Texas. Both had to face what many gay teens find, a religious parent who cannot deal with their child's sexuality. 
It's this fear, it's all motivated by fear of somehow disappointing God. Susan Cottrell is the mother of a gay daughter. She works with other Christian parents to help them accept their children as they are. They send them to camps hoping to outsource the problem of their kids and get help for their kid not to be gay. Lucas's mother would not agree to appear in our report, but told us on the phone she was only trying to help her son. She eventually was like, you know what, you're going to a program. The first program where Lucas was sent was located outside Mobile, Alabama, in the town of Pritchard. It called itself the Restoration Youth Academy, surrounded by barbed wire. Since I've been here at this program, I've come closer to God and my family. For the outside world, the academy used testimonials to promote itself as a place for troubled youth of all kinds to turn their lives around with prayer and the Bible. And God also intervened in our life, like, really, really dramatically. Now closed, other teens sent here, both gay and straight, say it was a place of torture and abuse carried out by the so-called Christian pastor who ran the boys' facility. He claimed to be a straight homophobe, and he said he, that he would cast out every homosexual spirit in, the, in every single homosexual male and female. Galen Wheeler, one of the non-gay troubled teens, says he was a witness to how Lucas and other boys who were gay were treated. They would try to preach to him about how homosexuality was a sin and everything, and if that didn't get through to him, then they would resort to alternative methods, as they called it. Isolation, beatings, getting whipped with a belt. <laughs> I can't stop seeing their faces, hearing the screams, hearing the crying. That's why I don't sleep at night. Lucas was only 13 years old when he says his mother left him here in the hands of the pastor whose brutality would emerge once she left. He asked her, he's like, Miss Hughes, do you mind if we uh, spank your kid? And you know what she said? Beat his ass. And did that happen? Oh yeah, it happened. Even worse, Lucas says, were these so-called isolation rooms, where he and others were left for long stretches of time. I only got let out about once a day to go to the bathroom, and sometimes they wouldn't feed you the three meals they were supposed to, so... so this is worse than any prison in this country. Oh, yeah. Prisons have laws and things they have to follow. This place, it was unlicensed. Nobody really knew it existed. But it turns out someone did know it existed. This Pritchard police captain, Charles Kennedy, who drove out here after a call from the concerned parents of another boy and discovered what he would call pure evil. I thought, my God, he is here. Lucifer is here doing business in our city with these children. 450 miles away, outside Hallsville, Texas. This is where Sarah Jabert says she was also being held against her will, a Christian facility that claims it helps gay teens. Like Lucas, Sarah felt powerless to resist what her parents had arranged. I was kind of in shock for a minute, and then I started yelling at them, and I told them that they couldn't do this. But they did. And she says she was told she would be kept here for a full year. Unaware that someone was about to come to her rescue, her own personal superhero, her cousin and TV star Jeremy Jordan, outraged that Sarah and other gay teens are sent away like this. You're telling them we don't accept who you are and we want to cleanse the world of your kind. The TV star and his effort to rescue his lesbian teen cousin. You know I, mean? I don't want to talk to you. The brutal pastor in Alabama like who beat the teens you under his control. The young boy. How I treat you. And Lucas's daring escape to help bring down his abusers when we return. Once again, Brian Ross. into a Christian camp for troubled youth Alabama. Some in shackles and hells. Look Greenfield could hear the rain whistles in the dents and dream of escape. There's a train really close to there that actually goes to California. 
thought safety, thought hope, but thought impossible. I would have done anything to get out of there. Anybody would have. Lucas says he imagined himself as a character in some escape film, like Steve McQueen's great escape from a Nazi prisoner of war camp. I really miss you, boys. Like Ice Cube escaping to fight corrupt politicians. But that was Hollywood, and the reality for Lucas was bleak, even as the train whistles beckoned. Every freaking night, it was really kind of depressing, because we never made it out. One year after we first met him, a lost teen sent away and punished for being gay, Lucas was now 17, a young man with a new look, but still struggling to get over what he had been through. It robbed me of my childhood. Most people don't come back from stuff like that. Every day I try to become better, but it almost is like impossible. But what kept Lucas going, he says, was a determination to do something about the so-called Christian pastors he said physically abused him here, especially this one, William Knott, feared by the children for his quick temper and special leather belts for whippings. He had names for the belts. One of them was Judy, one of them was um, Sugar Mama. Karen Baser was a counselor at the camp who says she quit when she saw the sadistic abuse by Knott and others. Will Knott is a sadist. You think so? I know so. Anybody that has names for their belts to whip children with with their bare bottoms is a sadist. Everybody was scared of him because they were afraid that if you don't listen to him, he's going to beat you. And it gets worse every time. Thrown in isolation and beaten and everything else because they were assumed to be gay. Gay was a sin. Gay is a sin. Gay is evil. Gay is the worst the abomination of God. Gay is horrible. Not refused our request to talk about the allegations. So we tracked him down, catching up with him in a restaurant parking lot, where we saw for ourselves how this Christian pastor reacts to someone he does not like. I don't want to talk to you. Why not? I'll tell you that because I don't like you. Get away from me. Is this how you treat the young this boys? This how I treat you. Get away from me. Is this how you treat Get the young boys? Get away from me, sir. Court documents obtained by 2020 show that before Knott came to Alabama, he was accused in a lawsuit of what a judge called medieval torture at another Christian boys academy for troubled youth, this one in Mississippi, including reports he used an electric cattle prod. You don't have a right to do this. I have a right to ask no, you a you question, don't. sir. I want to no, ask you, you know, I not, what I did you do to those young boys? Knott did not know it at the time we met him, but he was about to be taken down and it would be with the help of Lucas Greenfield that it happened. So you were thinking, I'll get you one day? Yeah, I knew they were gonna get what's coming to them eventually. That day of reckoning began years earlier when the police captain, Charles Kennedy, showed up here and soon realized something was not right. I noticed this, that when the boys were sitting there, nobody was talking, nobody was smiling. They were just too quiet. Nobody talked. Why not? They were scared. So he went around asking everybody for information. And, and they all said, sorry, I can't help you. But when he returned, some of the children slipped handwritten notes to Captain Kennedy, pleading for help. I've seen people get slammed, choked, and hit. Before it's too late, no one should be treated like this. Because they were taking a terrific risk, a terrific risk, because things could get brutal in there. These are the isolation boots. And then Captain Kennedy says he saw on a surveillance monitor in Knott's office a young boy named Austin who was locked in one of the isolation rooms naked because he had apparently threatened to kill himself. I pull Austin's chair over. I put my hands on his knees. Austin, look at me. What's going on here? He said yesterday, he said they took me into Knott's office in there not pulled out a 380 automatic pistol and told me that, that since I wanted to commit suicide, told me to put the gun to my head and pull the trigger. Mr. Ross, you could have knocked me out of that chair with a feather. Kennedy says not admitted to it, but said there were no bullets in the gun. I literally almost went cold. I could not believe what I was hearing. I knew then that I had crazy people that I was dealing with. 
So Kennedy, on his own, working from home, began to investigate, pulling up the past court records on Knott. Hey, Mrs. Henderson, how you doing? Charles Kennedy. And urging parents and grandparents of some of the other teens who had been sent there to take action. That place just ruined his life. I mean, you know. They've done that. He's not, unfortunately, he's not the only one whose life has been ruined by these people. But then, Kennedy told 2020, he ran into a wall a wall of indifference from local officials who were friendly with the pastors. I had been told that if I continued to investigate this thing, that I'd be fired for insubordination. And he says the indifference was present all the way to the State House in Montgomery. Nobody is interested in lifting a finger to save these children from this abuse. None. Zero. Including, he says, the Alabama Attorney General, Luther Strange, who has now been appointed to the U.S. Senate. The Attorney General's investigator, Kennedy says, reported to him that Attorney General Strange was not going to take any action. Mr. Strange's opinion was, quote, these children are out of state and their parents don't vote here, and I don't want the church is mad at me, and so we're not going to take on this issue. I don't know how he possibly could have gotten that word. It certainly didn't come from me. Outside his Capitol Hill office, Senator Strange told 2020 he sent two top investigators, but they found no wrongdoings. How could your investigators not find anything? You know, that's a good question, but uh, I have total confidence was it in there. Was it a full investigation or just a cursory effort? Uh, they spent a significant amount of time there, it's my understanding. In fact, it was only several hours at the camp, according to the lead investigator, who told us he never interviewed any of the boys. With no one able or willing to act, the camp continued to operate for more than three years. Its teen captives locked up and beaten, they say, on a regular basis. My mind kind of just like shut off. It was just like, okay, well, I'm done. But then, with Captain Kennedy still on their case, the Academy left the town of Pritchard and moved in with a local church under a new name inside the actual city limits of Mobile. And it only took one parent to complain to the Mobile Police Department before officers moved in. Now, it was William Knott and two other pastors who were in handcuffs, charged with child abuse. And the teens inside, including Lucas, were free, finally. I live here, and this is a humiliation and embarrassment to think that we have tolerated this. When we come back, the TV superhero Jeremy Jordan and his lesbian cousin Sarah, what it took to gain her freedom. Okay, so this is a bit of a rush job. Act Jeremy Jordan was filming his role for girl sidekick in the popular CB series. Are you crying? No. When he got some news that would affect him, the news about his 17-year-old lesbian cousin, Sarah, who had been sent away by her parents. They were taking drastic measures and putting her away for being gay, and, and she was terrified. It's a cry for help? Yeah, of course. Sarah Jabert was being held incommunicado at Heartlight Christian Boarding School outside Hallsville, Texas, a low-kept, sprawling, ranch-like facility. Her parents deny they sent her here because she had a girlfriend, but Heartlight says it is a place of refuge for teens, including lesbians. Well, we, we kind of specialize in that now. This is how its owner, Mark Gregston, describes the work on his website. I meet with girls across the country that are struggling in same-sex relationships, and, and, and I think I've just gained an understanding about how to approach them. And Sarah's friends feared that she was about to be put through an ordeal designed to stop her from embracing her sexuality. She had no contact with the outside world. They took away her phone, and she's just basically in this sort of surprise prison, almost. Prison? Yeah. Jordan's cousin Sarah is one of the unknown number of American gay teens who have been sent away to religious programs. As a Christian, I believe that the Bible teaches that uh, to choose to engage in homosexual conduct I is a sin. Pastor Peter Sprigg of the powerful conservative group the Family Research Council says there's no place for a brutality, but insists that what he calls sexual reorientation therapy with spirituality can work, disputing leading medical groups and the U.S. Surgeon General which say that such therapy is not effective and may cause harm. No, I don't agree with that. The you think it is sound? I think it is sound. And yes. that it does not harm the people who are put through this therapy? That's correct. With teenage boys and girls, it's 
probably the most likely to be effective because their sexuality is still developing and uh, therefore uh, they're less set in their ways. Six months earlier, Sarah had been taken by her parents to another Christian facility. This in Indiana for a three day sin with her parents and a Christian counselor. She kind of just said either you change or you don't get to go to heaven, kind of made it like an ultimatum. Now Sarah was stuck at the facility in Texas. Hardlight says it does not practice gay conversion, but does warn the parents of lesbians on its website that doing nothing only allows her to sink deeper into a lifestyle that God warns against. While Sarah says she saw no physical abuse here, she was still desperate to escape. Within days, running out to the road to flag down a passing motorist. Well, I got in the car of this lady, and she, I guess, put two and two together and figured out that I had uh, run from the boarding school program, and so she just took me back. But help was on the way, thanks to her celebrity cousin, Jeremy Jordan, who told 2020 he rallied other members of the family to support Sarah. I was excited. I was like, yes, we get to have, have a gay person in the family. <laughs> My mom always thought it was going to be me, so I was like, sorry. And as a small Texas boy who was making it big and showing this, this was Jordan in the Broadway play Newsies. And man, you is news. He set out to use his celebrity to launch an internet campaign, money for lawyers to get Sarah out. And I was like, we have to say something out loud about this. We started a GoFundMe page and it basically told Sarah's story, which is the story of so many young gay teens, especially in the South, and put it out there. Tonight, family members of a gay teen want her out of a Christian boarding facility. And within like a couple days, it was being picked up by all, you know, big news sites all around the country and around the world. Jeremy Jordan's plea to save his cousin from an anti-gay facility. Kids would be like, I'm going to ask my mom how much money they can, I can borrow. I'll put my allowance in for this. To help Sarah? Yeah, to help her. But there were also those angry about what Jordan was doing to help his gay cousin against her parents' wishes. You know, I can't believe that you are going against this girl's parents. In a statement to 2020, Sarah's parents said the programs they sent their daughter to were loving and could help. Quote, although we do not agree with some of our daughter's decisions, we love her unconditionally and continue to pursue a close relationship with her. It's very insulting to some parents to suggest that if the parent um, does not think that same-sex attractions are normal and natural and tries to discourage their child from pursuing um, homosexual relationships, that that's somehow unloving. Is there any evidence at all anywhere that that works? No. No, the evidence is it angers the child, it drives them to despair, it doesn't make them not gay. That's the one thing it doesn't do, is make them not gay. Did the family, family is not about scorping or who did more, it's about showing up. Like his character on Supergirl, Jeremy Jordan put family first when his cousin Sarah was shipped off. You brought yeah, the heat. Yeah, what basically people were writing to them and threatening to protest outside of their walls and to, you know, People were really taking action. And it worked. In the wake of all the public attention, the Heartlight -like Christian School sent Sarah home. I think eventually they just had me leave because people were threatening to come protest and, like, force their way in to get me out. Sarah now lives with relatives in Austin, near her girlfriend Haley, finishing high school, hoping that her parents and friends and neighbors in her small Texas town will one day understand. At the root of it was all her sexual identity and not being able to truly be who she was. But for other gay teens who don't have a famous cousin, teens like Lucas Greenfield, they have been on their own. Next, we go undercover to learn what teens like Lucas went through at a place called the Blessed Hope Boys Academy, a place where counselors first used the Bible and then the belt. When we return. With the brutal pastor William Knott now in handcuffs, his so-called Christian Academy shut down. Lucas Greenfield was sent back to his mother in Naples, Florida, more firm than ever that he was definitely gay, to the outrage of his mother. And she said, look, as Christian parents, as people of God, we cannot have you being who you are, your lifestyle of homosexuality. We cannot have that inside of our Christian house. 
And within days, Lucas was being driven back to Alabama by his mother, turned over to another Christian academy in that state's secretive network of places available to parents of gay teens. The Blessed Hope Boys Academy in Robertsdale, Alabama. They can help you. They can change your sinful ways through prayer and the Bible. And when you pulled in there, what did you think? Well, what the hell? What is this? And when I got out of the car, they were like, oh, you're the gay kid, right? And I'm like, great. Yeah, I'm the gay kid. They're like, well, we're going to change that. And I'm like, no, you're not. Leading advocates of therapy to help teens reject a gay lifestyle insist there are no such places like this one. I think this idea of sort of reorientation camps is part of the mythology that has been uh, built up around this, and they really don't exist. They don't exist. Uh, if you know of any, if you found tangible evidence of any, I would like to see it. Where's Brother Gary? So watch this video. Brother Gary. Recorded by a 2020 undercover team at the Blessed Hope Boys Academy. Inside, a chorus of teens singing hymns. undercover team included the actual mother of a gay teen from Washington State, accompanied by ABC News producer Brian Epstein. They arrived to meet with the man who calls himself Brother Gary, Gary Wiggins, the executive director of the so-called Academy for Troubled and Disenfranchised Youth. I know we talked on the phone previously. Yes, ma'am. And you know that my main concern is that my son believes he's a homosexual. Mm -hmm. I've had some boys that come in the program before that the parents have told me the same thing you've told me, that he, that he, he says he's, he's queer. One way or another, we're going to we're gonna get, a, get a handle on it, you know. You know, this boy here claims to be um, homosexual. Now, I don't know if he is not. During his preaching sometimes, Brother Gary would say to the boys, that's just queer. What are you, queer? Are you faggot, son? One former teacher, Rodney Pinkston, said he warned Lucas when he arrived to be very careful around Brother Gary. I said, well, I mean, Brother Gary doesn't like the fact that boys would, would be that way with other boys here. If you are that way, don't do anything. But Brother Gary told us he had a huge record of success with his methods. So you get quite a bit of feedback then on how successful this line of redirection is? Yes, yes I do. And what is your success? Uh, if, I had to, if I had to guess out of 100, I'd say probably 80. So what do they do to try to convert you? The Bible. Read these passages about how wrong homosexuality is. Write this down a hundred times. It's one of the great sins of the flesh. It's evil. It's not right, you know. It's not right. It's going against the Word of God. It is not biblically right, and no matter what he says or what anybody else says, it's not, it's not right. If you ever want to have a relationship with your parents again, you're going to drop this choice that you made. You made the choice to be gay, so now you didn't make the choice to go back to being straight. And Lucas says, in the short time that he was here, Brother Gary moved from the Bible to the belt when he resisted. Well, you know you got to turn straight, right? No, not going to happen. Well, then we're going to try to make you. He took a belt? Yeah, took off his belt and started swinging. I'm going to beat the gay demon and the Catholic occult out of you. Those are Brother Gary's words. Yes. I had big marks all over my back, on my leg. Actually, I had them on my arm, too. I had my hand when I grabbed it. Through his lawyer, Brother Gary said he has never assaulted any young men under his care in any way and requires parents to give written permission to strike their children, what he calls SWATs. I would do it just because but one, just because he said it's clear, I'm not going to do that. Right. It's got to be something. It's got to it's get to the point where he's doing something really bad. Right. What He calls it a SWAT. What do you call it? I call it child abuse. So we got cows, and then we got chickens here. On a tour of the facility, Brother Gary told our undercover team he likes to keep his boys here for a year or two and charges $21,000 a year. We got a doctor we use and a dentist we use. In the last three years, he has taken in close to $1 million. 
It's very disturbing to me that one man can be in charge of a whole camp like this and run it the way he runs it and has no oversight. Under Alabama's religious freedom law, neither Brother Gary nor the Blessed Hope Boys Academy nor anyone working here is required to be licensed or in any way supervised because it's all considered part of a church ministry. He's ruling by fear. He can swat them. He can do whatever means it takes, he said, to get compliance. Of course they're afraid of him. I call it abusive. It's spiritually abusive. It's physically abusive. It's in many ways abusive. Our background check on Brother Gary found that Gary Wiggins has a criminal record going back to the 1990s, including convictions for assault and the sale and possession of cocaine. But Wiggins claimed to our undercover team he works closely with the local sheriff, who, he said, helps round up teens when they try to escape from the camp. Because sometimes they will run. I mean, you know, they, they, you know, this boy here has run on me before. This boy right here. He has actually run off on me before. And uh, the law bar him back. <laughs> but Lucas did not need to escape from here. A few days after resisting Brother Gary and causing so much trouble, Lucas was being moved late at night to a new Christian ministry across the state line in Florida. When the staff stopped for gas at a bathroom break, Lucas made his break. I waited for the guy to get out of the car. I climbed right over to the driver's seat, opened the door, walked out, and I took off running. They were running after you? Yeah. I ran into a construction site, um, jumped the fence, basically stayed in the construction site overnight. Made it to the next little town over, and I knocked on the guy's door, and I told him, hey, this is what happened. I need you to call the police. When we first met William Knott, he showed us the hair-trigger temper that so frightened the teens under his control. We've been trying you want to get a hold I don't you. want to talk to you. Why not? I'll tell you that because I don't like you. But now at the circuit courthouse in Mobile, Alabama, it was a much different William Knott, finally facing justice on trial along with two others for child abuse at the so-called Christian Academy they ran. They want to bring in these kids from all over the country, far away from their real homes. Uh, they keep them there through abuse and coercion. Uh, they're making money off of the families. The case was prosecuted by Assistant District Attorney Keith Blackwood. This case is very important for Mobile County and for Alabama and really the country because these types of, uh, quote, schools, and I use that very loosely, but these types of places uh, seem to pop up all over the place. And arriving at the courthouse to be a key witness against Knott, Lucas Greenfield, the gay teen who says he was beaten and abused by Knott so many times. Reunited with the now retired police captain, Charles Kennedy, who helped to rescue Lucas. This is payday. You have the power to tell people what they did, expose the evil these people stood for. Lucas and five other teens, gay and straight, took the stand coming face to face with the man who they say so abused them. Was it difficult to face down? Will not? At first. Why? Because he tried giving me that little stare, that evil, that evil little man stare, like, I'm going to do something, but he couldn't do anything. You told the truth? Yes. And what did you say? Exactly what happened. I told him about the beatings, I told him about the abuse, I told him about everything. Alabama courts permit video recording, but no audio. The handcuffs, the shackles, the isolation. Lucas's testimony is extremely important to the trial. You know, the, the main reason is because he was one of the first witnesses that was willing to, to tell the truth about what happened. They were being threatened, and uh, Lucas was uh, one that finally said, something can be done this time, we need to tell the truth, and that's what happened. Mobile County jurors heard from child abuse victims today. And testimony in this case resumes tomorrow with more witnesses from the state. After five days of testimony, the case went to the jury. It's like a weight lifted off. Um, and it's also really, it brings a lot of peace to me to know that I, for what I do is I stand up for what's right and what I believe in. And this was definitely something that I needed to do. And then the verdict, guilty on all counts. Nod and the other so-called Christian pastors taken away in handcuffs, sentenced to 20 years in prison. A sentence Judge Charles Graddock told 2020 was more than warranted given the crimes committed. 
Very disturbing, Brian. And the sentence was uh, severe, 20 years. Yeah, and I'm not so sure it wasn't severe enough. I hope that uh, this sentence goes out across wherever these places might exist to let prosecutors and judges and others know that uh, these people can be prosecuted and severely punished. Conversion therapy has been widely discredited. Discredited practice of conversion therapy. Across the country, even for those places where brutality is not an issue, so-called gay conversion therapy remains highly controversial. In Washington, senators demanded to know how President Trump's nominee for Secretary of Education, Betsy DeVos, stood on the issue. It has been shown to lead to depression, anxiety, drug use, homelessness, and suicide, particularly in LGBT youth. Mrs. DeVos, do you still believe in conversion th therapy? Senator Franken, um, I've never believed in that. But her Republican Party at its convention last year appeared to tacitly endorse the concept, supporting the right of parents to determine the proper medical treatment and therapy for their minor children. Just like the language the Family Research Council uses to defend legality of therapy for gay teens. I don't think it should be illegal because we allow parents to make a lot of decisions for their children regarding their medical care. We do not delegate to minors the ability to make these uh, adult decisions. You call but, this medical care? Well, I call it a form of mental health care. There's a mental disorder they're trying to cure. That's what you're saying. Well, if someone is experiencing something mentally, like same-sex attractions, that is causing distress, then that's a mental health issue. I'm a Christian, a conservative, and a Republican in that order. And the Family Research Council says it hopes efforts to make the therapy illegal will stop under the Trump administration. And you think they support your view? Well, I hope they support my, uh, my view. When Mike Pence ran for Congress in Indiana in the 1990s, his campaign agenda included this. Resources should be directed toward those institutions which provide assistance to those seeking to change their sexual behavior. According to the vice president's spokesperson, Mr. Pence did not and does not support gay conversion therapy. But it is the continued belief that there is a way to change a teenager's sexuality that led to the places where Lucas Greenfield and others were so abused. Me liking guys over girls, that's what messed up my whole life. Adopted at age three, essentially abandoned at age 13, and through his ordeal with one brutal Christian pastor after another, there was only one adult Lucas would come to trust. He showed me that there are still good people out there that will do whatever it is necessary to help you. The Alabama police captain who put his career on the line to help, becoming the father figure Lucas wishes he had had. He went beyond being a police officer. He went beyond being a Christian. He went beyond anything. And Lucas did not know it, but as Kennedy worked to expose what was happening, Lucas and others were helping to fill the hole in the captain's heart after the death of his own son, Sean, from a serious illness. I miss him. And in a way, this is a mission yep. on behalf of Sean. That's right. Because children should be treated decently. They should never have to suffer like this. And now a look at a special two-hour edition of 2020 next Friday, the bone-chilling story of the infamous cult leader Charles Manson, the puppet mastermind behind the murder of actress Sharon Tate and six others. But still relevant tonight as we now dig into the psychology of how ordinary people can be brainwashed into doing something reprehensible. How can they follow the leader with no remorse? He said, the first time I came as Jesus, this time I'm coming as the devil. Every one of you out there has tried to kill me, and I'm still here. Ha, ha, ha. Now what? You know, evil is very difficult to kill. Manson has it all. It has glamour and movie stars. Manson's goal in life was to become a bigger rock star than the Beatles. You flat on me with all your attention. I never told anybody to do anything other than what they wanted to do. And if they wanted to do murder, they would do That's not my business, woman. I'm not a Sunday school teacher. Everybody likes that evil character. They create, you know, you know that, that guy with the eyes. The door opened, and Charlie Manson looked up at me and said, you can't leave the group. Have a good day.
The Family Manson. Next Friday at a special time, 9, 8 central on ABC. This is really going to be fascinating. Mm -hmm. It's a two-hour event next Friday starting at 9 Eastern. We'll see you then. In the meantime, thanks for watching tonight. I'm David Muir. And I'm Elizabeth Vargas from all of us here at 2020 and ABC News. Have a great night and a great weekend.